Good morning, Lakeside. And uh, welcome to all of you who have joined us this morning for our online service from Salmon RBC. My name is Ken Dryden, pastor here at Lakeside Community Church. And uh, as we begin this morning, I want to certainly welcome everyone who's joined, whatever day you're watching this. And uh, thanks for doing that. We want to just let you know about some of the resources that are available to help you in this time of worship. Uh, there is a playlist that's posted on our website uh, each Sunday. So what we're encouraging you to do is if you'd like to use that playlist as a way of just preparing your hearts, worshiping uh, at home or in your backyard gathering, uh, either before or after uh, our online service that's available for you each week. There's also a discussion guide that is posted each week as well. That's for use in the backyard gatherings. Uh, but if you're not part of that gathering and you'd like to use that in your home, it's a great way to just engage with the scriptures and the theme of the morning. So speaking of uh, backyard gatherings, we started this a number of weeks back. So uh, smaller groups that are meeting outdoors and uh, observing uh, physical distancing. And those will continue while uh, weather permits. Uh, and uh, if you're not part of a backyard gathering, let me just encourage you that this is a very important part of, of what we're doing here at Lakeside in this season and a great way to connect with others and, and in a smaller group to be able to interact, to pray together, to share what's, what's going on in your lives and what God is teaching you and to uh, ask questions and to have discussion about uh, the scriptures that are uh, being talked about each uh, Sunday. So if you're not part of one of those, uh, let me encourage you to get in touch and we will let you know where those groups are meeting each week. Uh, someone, or actually th this question has come up a number of times over the last number of weeks uh, where people will ask, you know, why isn't the church meeting? Uh, and really what they're meaning is, uh, why aren't you meeting in your indoor location at uh, in downtown Salmon Arm? Well, um, we, uh, the first thing I would say is that the church is meeting. And so each week we're meeting uh, in our homes or out in our backyards uh, throughout the week. Hopefully we're ha having connections together, whether it's on Zoom or in person, uh, doing things in a way that's safe. We're still wanting to be, um, we're not fearful, uh, we're not uh, anxious about this, but uh, we are wanting to take care and to follow the provincial guidelines and to think about others who may be vulnerable in our community and in our church community. So that's why we're keeping to those regulations and we're not rushing into uh, indoor uh, larger gatherings uh, before it's time. But it's also a great time for us to just reflect on what does it mean to be the church. And it means much more than just gathering in one place at a certain hour on Sunday morning. But saying that, uh, we are planning an indoor gathering at our downtown location uh, on September the 27th. So that will be our first time back in the indoor location for a number of months and we're looking forward to that. There's a, a preparations that uh, have been made and are being made as we speak. And uh, we will be posting our guidelines for that so that you can be confident that we are uh, doing the appropriate things to make sure that we're ready. Uh, if you are wanting to come, uh, what we would ask is that you let us know ahead of time. So by uh, September the 25th, that's the Friday before that Sunday, we would like you to either call or email the office and let us know you're coming and how many people in your group that will are planning to be here. Uh, we would prefer that people don't just show up. So this way we can get uh, our chairs set up appropriately. Uh, we can keep our number under 50 and uh, we make sure that we do that well. Uh, the service will be at 10 o'clock uh, on Sunday morning. If there is a, a, a desire for more than you know what we're we've said is our limit, we will consider having a second service. But uh, you'll need to know to let us know um, as much in advance as you can, please. So that's uh, being planned, September twenty seventh. Um, one of the challenges of this time has been connecting. So whether it's online or in person, uh, and one of the things that we want to encourage in terms of connections is that we are connecting through the scriptures, not just on Sundays, but throughout the week. And so uh, one thing that um, Christians have done for centuries 
is uh, read through uh, daily scripture readings together uh, as local churches. And actually, there are uh, churches all over the world, hundreds and thousands of them, where they read the same scriptures each day. So often there'll be a, a psalm, a scripture from the Psalms, there'll be an Old Testament reading, there'll be a New Testament reading, and maybe certain prayers. And so uh, that is something that we would like to try, is that as a church, uh, we are reflecting on the same scriptures each day of the week. And so we have provided you with uh, some daily scripture readings uh, that you can start with. You can, do, you can split those up into a morning and an evening reading. You can just take one out of those scriptures if you want. We're encouraging to you to read uh, all of them if you can. It won't take you a long time. But just as a discipline, just to all be in the same scriptures each day, I think would be a, a great benefit to us as a church. So that whenever we come together, or even online, we can say, you know, uh, I was reading that, the scripture in the Psalms this morning, and this is what uh, God seemed to be saying to me. And and the person you're communicating with will also be reading the same scripture. And so we can get a sense of what God is saying to us collectively as a community. So whether you have a pattern of doing that uh, already or not, uh, let me encourage you to try this for this season. And maybe it's something that we continue on long term. I'm hoping it will be. Uh, so even if you already have a plan, if you would consider um, adopting this, so that we can be on the same page and reading through the scriptures together. And uh, so let's, uh, let's try that. So those are available. They'll be on the website, uh, on our Facebook page. We can mail those to you, however, whatever works best for you. So that will be starting right away. Uh, this morning, we have uh, a guest speaker, not in person, but by video. So a good friend of uh, Vera and I, uh, Keith Kitchen, and some of you know him. He's been out here. He's done a couple of uh, concerts uh, in the past. He is a singer-songwriter. He is a pastor uh, with Westlife uh, Alliance Church in Calgary. And so he uh, agreed to send me one of his recent uh, sermons on video. And the topic of that sermon is Navigating Adversity. So we will be watching that this morning. And he has also uh, sent us a number of uh, songs that their worship team has uh, done recently. So that will be our, our worship time this morning in our online service. So we're so thankful for uh, Keith and for Westlife Alliance Church in Calgary for being willing to do that for us. So God bless you as you uh, join us this morning uh, for worship online. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning that you are with us, always you're with us. Lord, I pray that we, wherever we're gathering, whether in our homes or in backyards, uh, that Lord God, we would sense your presence, that we would acknowledge that you are with us and you desire to speak to us. So Spirit of God, uh, we pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds to hear and to recognize that uh, Lord Jesus, you are here with us. Come Holy Spirit, minister to each one who is watching this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your songs again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be sing when the evening comes. So bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll 
worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find So bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I'll worship your holy name draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore so bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. Sing it. Well, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my. I worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. Good morning. Our call to worship today is from Colossians 3.16. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Let's worship together today. Our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 119 and verses 89 through verse 105. Psalm 119, 89 to 105. Your eternal word, O Lord, stands firm in the heaven. Your faithfulness extends to every generation, as enduring as the earth you created. Your, re your regulations remain true to this day, for everything serves your plans. If your instructions hadn't sustained me with joy, I would have died in my misery. I will never forget your commandments for by them you give me life. I'm yours, rescue me, for I've worked hard at obeying your commandments. Though the wicked hide along the way to kill me, I will quietly keep my mind on your laws. Even perfection has its limits, but your commands have no limit. Oh, how I love your instructions. I think about them all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies for they are my constant guide. Yes, I have more insight than my teachers, for I'm always thinking of your laws. I'm even wiser than my elders, for I've kept your commandments. I have refused to walk on any evil path so that I may remain obedient to your word. I haven't turned away from your regulations, for you have taught me well. How sweet your words taste to me. They are sweeter than honey. Your commandments give me understanding. No wonder I hate every false way of life. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. This is the word of the Lord. I want to pray uh, before 
uh, Pastor Keith comes to bring the message this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning for your word. It's a lamp to our to guide our feet and a light for our path. And so, Father, I pray that we would have the same kind of joy and love for your word as the psalmist does, uh, that we would just long to hear from you through your word. And so this morning, I thank you for Keith and the message that uh, he's going to bring about us uh, about um, navigating adversity. And so I pray, Lord, this morning that you would speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 119 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. I've taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing praise of my mouth, and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. In the spring of 1996, John Krakauer uh, was doing an article for Outside Magazine. He was covering a story about the new uh, phenomenon of commercialized expeditions on Mount Everest. Uh, two climbers in particular, uh, Scott Fisher and Rob Hall, had started companies uh, where they uh, had developed a method and proven that they could take anyone with a reasonable amount of physical fitness and put them on the summit of Mount Everest, uh, regardless of whether they had any mountaineering experience uh, at all. And so there were several people who took them, uh, took them up on their offer. See, Mount Everest, uh, as you know, is the world's tallest mountain, but it's not considered one of the most difficult mountains in the world. In fact, as far as mountaineering goes, uh, Mount, Mount Everest is, is a, uh, it's a brutal climb because of the altitude, um, but in terms of the technical difficulty, it, it's apparently not a very difficult climb at all. And so Fisher and Hall had started these companies where they claimed they could put anybody uh, on, the, on the summit of Everest. And as you can imagine, all kinds of people with, uh, with the means to, to take them up on their offer did so. Uh, but as you can also imagine, they were flirting with disaster. May 10th, 1996 was the, the uh, would prove to be the deadliest day in mountaineering history. On uh, May 10th, 1996, eight people uh, died on the mountain, including uh, Scott Fisher and Rob Hall. John Krakauer, who was covering this phenomenon, summited with them that day uh, and was a first-hand witness who lived to tell the story of everything that happened. His book, Into the Thin Air, uh, was a bestseller. And uh, it is a fascinating study of leadership, of disaster, of human nature, of decision-making, and tragedy. And of all the stories that he tells, one of the most fascinating and heart-wrenching was the story of Andy Harris. Andy Harris was an experienced climber who summited that day and who, like the other uh, climbers in the group, lingered on the summit for a little too long as the deadly blizzard uh, that would take the mountain that day blew in uh, and, and claimed the lives uh, of these climbers. And coming down from the summit late in the day, Andy Harris was still high on the mountain when his oxygen ran out. Now, uh, several people climb Everest without su uh, supplemental oxygen, but it's very, very difficult to do. Most climbers who climb Everest uh, carry an oxygen bottle to supplement their oxygen because at 29,000 feet, the atmosphere contains about 30% of the oxygen that it does at sea level. And so even physically fit, experienced mountaineers like Harris, uh, at that altitude, uh, uh, can experience the effects of hypoxia. And hypoxia uh, uh, leads to all kinds of dangerous um, uh, complications like cerebral and pulmonary edema, uh, increased risk of frostbite, and hallucinations and delusion. And so Harris was coming down from the summit and he radioed base camp to tell them that his oxygen supply was running out. And base camp radioed back to Harris and they said, about 100 meters from where you are, there's a cache of oxygen bottles. If you can get there, you can get a bottle and uh, plug in and you'll, you'll, you'll be fine. 
And so a little while later, Andy Harris radioed base camp to tell them that he had arrived at the cache, but that the oxygen bottles were empty. He was picking up bottles and shaking them and testing them, uh, and he found that they were all empty. And the guys at base camp couldn't understand this. They radioed back and they said, Andy, uh, no, no, there, there should be some full oxygen bottles there. Just, uh, just test them. And he radioed back in despair and said, no, no, they're all empty. And to their horror, the crew at base camp realized what was happening. In his oxygen-deprived state, Andy Harris was holding full bottles of oxygen, shaking them. But because of his oxygen-starved brain, he was deluded, he was hallucinating, and he thought that they were empty. And the tragedy of the story is that Andy Harris died on the mountain that day, literally holding in his hands the thing that could save his very life. Navigation and good decision-making skills are critical in the high alpine, and they're critical for you and me. Uh, when you experience adversity, it's so easy to become lost and disoriented, uh, and it's so important to know how to navigate through the dark and through the storms and through the adversity that we all experience in uh, different seasons of life. I have the privilege of sharing with you from God's Word uh, this week and next, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, navigating some of the storms and some of the adversity that, that comes our way. And so uh, I want to explore what God's Word has to say about navigating uh, these strange times. You know, as Christians, we recognize that the Scriptures are the key to helping us navigate life. In fact, uh, one of the most important, important assets that you and I have as Christians, um, as, we, as we try to navigate life, is to have a uh, a working and a growing knowledge of the scriptures. Uh, and it, in fact, if you were to meet with any of our pastors and say to them that, you know, I'm kind of going through a dry time in my life uh, with the Lord and, and, and uh, uh, I'm struggling in my walk with God. You know, if you were to meet with any of them, one of the first questions that they would ask you is, tell me about your devotional time. Tell me about, uh, about your time in, this, in the scripture. And uh, that would be one of the first, you know, kind of clues that they would use to diagnose what might be going on in your spiritual life. It's not to say that the only reason uh, you might be struggling in your spiritual life um, is that you're not, you know, rooted in God's Word. But uh, it's certainly one of, the, one of the first things that we would look uh, towards. Just, just like if you were to go to your doctor and say, oh, you know, I'm feeling kind of like tired and lethargic all the time. I'm not feeling great. You know, one of the first things your, your doctor would ask you is, you know, how are you dealing with stress? Uh, are you eating healthy? Are you sleeping? Are you exercising? And so if you were to talk to any of our pastors uh, about your walk with the Lord, uh, one of the first things they would ask you is, tell me about your time in the Word and how that's going. Uh, so this morning, I want to look at the importance of being rooted in God's Word. And um, we're going to look at three things, you know, really briefly. Uh, the first uh, question I want to ask is, why is it important? Why is it important to have uh, a growing uh, experience and knowledge of the Scriptures? The second one I want to, uh, 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 question I want to ask is, why can't you grow to be more like Jesus without it? And then the third thing I want us to look at is how to ease the burden. How to, uh, so many Christians I talk to, uh, and, and I think almost any Christian you would talk to has gone through times in their life when it's been difficult to stay rooted in God's Word. And so we're going to look at, and not only why is that, but how, uh, how do we ease the burden of that? How do we make that so much more accessible and easier? So that's what we're going to do this morning. First of all, why is it important? Why is it important to be rooted in God's Word? Well, uh, as we read our uh, scripture earlier this morning, the scripture says that God's Word is uh, a light for our, our, our uh, for our path and a lamp, uh, a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had this grand ambition uh, with a friend of mine that we were gonna uh, start section hiking the Great Divide Trail. The Great Divide Trail is a long trail. It runs from Waterton and the U.S. border. It follows the Continental Divide all the way north to Kakwa Lake, which is almost Grand Prairie. It's 1,200 kilometers. And um, uh, some people do that in in a very short time. They'll do it in like, you know, uh, I think the, the record is like two or three weeks. And, uh, and so as I was sort of obsessing about this, this it's be kind of become one of the bucket lists, um, you know, for me, uh, items that, that, you know, I'd love to try and do someday is to try to through hike the entire Great Divide Trail. Hey, actually, as I think of it, maybe as, as you're listening this morning, 
Um, just in the Facebook comments, have you got a bucket list? Have you got a bucket list adventure that maybe you wanted to do? Maybe you want to uh, go like sea kayaking in Fiji. Maybe you want to hike the Appalachian Trail. Maybe you want to climb Mount Everest, uh, although maybe not after listening to Andy Harris's story. Why don't you just put something in the comments and just let us know, like, what's on your bucket list? But for me, hiking the Great Divide Trail was one of my uh, uh, bucket list thing. And so I started to research this, like how do these guys hike so fast? And I realized the way that they do it is they scrutinize their gear choices. They, they hike with backpacks that are incredibly light. And the way they do that is they, uh, you know, they, they, they scrutinize every piece of equipment they take. They, they'll shave the handle off their toothbrush and they'll, uh, you know, count out, you know, the amount of, the particular amount of ibuprofen and, and you know, stove fuel and everything that they're gonna take. And, uh, I had no idea the kind of debates that occur in the ultralight forums on, on the internet. You wouldn't believe it, but I remember reading a whole article uh, on the debate of whether to carry a headlamp or a flashlight. And you'd say, why not carry both? Listen, if you're asking that question, you really don't understand the psychology of these ultralight hikers. Like, carry two flashlights? Forget it. Some of them might not even carry one. But, but the debate rages. Should you carry a headlamp or should, should you carry a handheld flashlight? And those in the headlamp uh, camp would say, carry a headlamp because when you've got a headlamp, your hands are free. You can do other things. When you're hiking at night, you can see the path you know, ahead of you. And a headlamp is good for seeing uh, uh, you know, far ahead. But those in the, the problem with the headlamp though, is that it washes out the features of the trail. It doesn't cast enough shadow if you're hiking at night to see the rocks and the roots and, and all the obstacles and things. And so that's where a handheld flashlight is better. You, you carry it lower to the ground, it creates more shadow, and you can see the kinds of things that, that you're gonna trip over. And so there's, there's this huge debate. Do I want a headlamp or do I want a handheld flashlight? Well, the, the great, uh, an ultralight backpacker might have to decide between those two things. But the beautiful thing about God's Word is that we don't have to decide. The scripture says that God's Word is a lamp for my feet and it's a light for my path. It's a lamp for my feet. If you've ever walked with a lamp, you know that a, a lantern throws light in 360 degrees. You can see all the, 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 the roots and the rocks and the, the, all the, the things around you. And this is what God's Word is saying about itself. It's, it says uh, a little later in that psalm that uh, my enemies have laid a trap for me and there's, there's obstacles and there's things that I want to avoid. There's temptations and desires. And so God's Word will shine a light uh, to help you to understand the geography of your soul, of your heart, in a way that you can understand the, the temptations and the pitfalls and the desire. But it's also, it's a light for, my, for your path. It, it would be useless to have a light that would just show you what's around your feet without showing you where you're going. And so as you root yourself in God's Word, it, it not only helps you to understand the geography of your soul and the temptations around you and the obstacles, but it also sh gives you a path, a vision for your life, a direction, and a sense that, that that you are a part of God's story. You're living God's story. He has a plan. He has a, a path. He has a way that he wants you to walk in. And so this is the benefit. And so as you root yourself in God's word, you begin to understand the temptations around you and how to avoid them. You begin to understand the, the plan and the path and the direction that God has for you so that you can walk in it. And so that's what's so great about it. We don't, we don't need to choose. It's a lamp for our feet and it's a light for our path. Um, the other reason that it's, it's so important to root ourselves in God's word is that it's, it's the clearest way to hear his voice. You know, you think about, think about how much easier life would be, how much clearer life would be if you could just hear God's voice. If you could hear, you know, the, the decisions you're trying to make and the, the questions that you're wrestling with. If you could just hear God speak to you, how much easier would it be to navigate those things? And, and so while sometimes it's, it's difficult to hear God speaking to us and, and to, to sense his direction in our souls, his direction in his word is clear. And we shouldn't expect God to speak to us apart from his word if we haven't read the way he's already spoken to us through his word. Um, and so it's, it's, it's so important to, to root ourselves in God's word. It's a lamp, a lamp for our feet, a light for our path, and it's, uh, it's the clearest way to hear the voice of Jesus in our lives. Which leads me to my second point. Uh, why can't we grow to be more like Jesus without God's Word? Uh, there's a misconception out there that you can be like Jesus and not read your Bible. And I understand that. Uh, many of you have had experiences with religious people. You know people who are cold and hard and religious. They're graceless. They're uncaring. Uh, they're abrupt. 
And unfortunately, there are also people who can quote scripture, chapter and verse, and they can weaponize it. And you've walked into the path of that. And so there's part of, uh, if you're trying to follow Jesus, there's a temptation, a very real temptation to say, listen, I just, I don't want to be like those people. I just want to become like Jesus. And I, I don't want to uh, become like those, those stuffy religious people. And, uh, uh, and I get it. But, but he, I want to say to you this morning that um, if, if we think that we can grow to be like Jesus, without being rooted in his word, then we really don't know Jesus at all. Um, now, I'm not, I, I realize that that might sound like an almost kind of an inf- offensive kind of a statement, and I'm not trying to be mean or step on toes or anything uh, when I say that, but here's the thing. If you read the Gospels, you see that Jesus hardly ever spoke without quoting scripture. Jesus was saturated with scripture. Scripture was his native tongue. Um, when he was Confronted uh, by the, the devil in the desert when he, when he was tempted uh, by the enemy, he responded. The way that he responded to the enemy was by quoting scripture. Every time he confronted the Pharisees, he quoted scripture. Scripture uh, was Jesus' native tongue. If you cut him, he bled scripture. And, and you may think I'm being hyperbolic when I say that. I'm not. Um, even on the cross, even as Jesus was dying and taking hell for you and I, His final words, his dying breath, he quoted Psalm 31, into my hands I commit my spirit. And so there's no version of Jesus that isn't rooted in Scripture. So if you're trying to be like Jesus without being rooted in Scripture, the Jesus that we're trying to be like is imaginary. I know it's hard to develop the habit of getting into God's Word, so I want to share a secret with you. This is my third point um, that I think will help to ease the burden. I know you'll say it's hard. Um, I know you'll say, I really should get into God's Word, but I just can't find the time. Um, but I think, I think when you hear yourself say that out loud, you start to realize that it's a smokescreen. Um, we have time for every other thing. We have time for everything that's important to us. Uh, we have time to binge watch our favorite shows on Netflix. We have uh, time to uh, to watch our favorite hockey team or our favorite uh, adventure race. We have uh, time to, uh, uh, to spend on our phones or on Facebook or social media or any of those kinds of things. And the other thing that you might say is, well, you know, I just, you know, I'd like to memorize God's word, but I, I can't. I just don't, I don't have, I'm not very good at memorizing things. But I mean, again, be honest, we memorize all kinds of things. I know guys who can quote every sports statistic or engine spec or, uh, you know, folks who can quote every bit of gossip about the royal family. And let's face it, if you're a guy under 50 years old, you know you can quote every line of Star Wars And if you can't do that, you can do The Princess Bride, for sure. So our problem is that um, I don't think, even though we say it's time, and we say that our problem is that we have trouble memorizing things, I don't think that's it. I think that's a smokescreen. I think um, uh, uh, it's something deeper than that. Now, I know that you've heard all kinds of daunting stories. You've heard stories about people's devotional lives that just make you uh, feel uh, uh, like it's impossible to be like that. People who get up at three in the morning and, and, you know, read for three hours and pray and journal and, and read through the Bible every three months and all that sort of thing. And all that's great. But that's not you. And that's not me. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about uh, uh, having some grand, ambitious life in the Word. We're talking about getting started aren't we? So how do we get started? Well, what if, what if you had a goal that just like once in your life you're going to read through the whole Bible? Maybe not the whole Bible every year. What if you just decided that once in your life you're going to, you're going to read through the whole Bible and then you made a plan to do that? Or, or what if you decided that, that this year you were going to read one of the Gospels, right? Or, or you're going to read all of Paul's letters or something like that, whatever. Maybe the book of Genesis, whatever it is. There's a saying don't let the perfect be the enemy, the enemy of the good. And so many times I think we feel daunted. We want to have this perfect devotional life. And because we can't, then we don't even try to have a good one. So let me just say this morning, what we're talking about here, we're not talking about summiting Mount Everest. 
We're talking about getting a foot on the mountain. So what can you do to get a foot on the mountain? And maybe you have an idea, maybe you want to actually throw it in the Facebook comments. But um, like maybe you'll commit to, I'm going to read one of the Gospels this year, or I'm going to read, you know, through Paul's letters, something like that. Um, if you find it difficult to read a, a paper Bible, um, you know, Pastor Bryce mentioned several weeks ago, there's all kinds of other resources. You could use the YouVersion Bible. Uh, it'll even send you reminders. You love getting texts. Why not get a text every day from God, like a, like a verse of the day? They have a thing like that. You just get a notification on your phone. Just read that. Tell yourself you're going to do that. Um, or uh, uh, Pastor Bryce also mentioned the Dwell app. You can let somebody else read the scripture to you. Um, but do something. Um, it's easy just to get started. Don't, don't think so much about having this grand devotional life yet. Just get started. And if you're doing something more next week than, uh, than you're doing today, you're winning. So uh, why not start that? But I think that the problem with getting into God's Word, it doesn't, it's, it's, it's just about forming habits. All of us know how to form habits. We learn to brush your teeth. We learn to change the furnace filter. We learn to put salt in the water softener, uh, change the oil in our car, whatever. We learn to develop those habits. I don't think our problem is that we have trouble developing habits. I think it's deeper than that. Um, I think that most people, what stops them from reading the Bible is they're afraid of what they'll find there. They're afraid about becoming a stuffy religious person. And we've already talked about that. Um, they're afraid that if they get into the Bible, they're going to read all these commandments and rules and everything, and it's going to leave them feeling guilty and horrible. And this stems from a fundamental uh, misunderstanding about the Bible. See, there's two ways to understand, uh, two ways to read the Bible and, and to understand what it's about. The first way is to understand that the Bible is all about you. And the second way is to understand that it's all about Jesus. If you read the Bible, uh, you can read the Passover story and think, okay, every year we have to do this feast and we have to, we have to get the lamb and it has to be just so. We need the bitter herbs and we got to read the scriptures and we got to do all these kinds of things. You can read that story and think it's all about you and that you have to do all these things. Or you can read that story and realize it's all about him, that he was that Passover lamb, that he was the one who fulfilled all of that. Um, you can read through the book of Leviticus. You can read through all the, the dreaded book of Leviticus. You can read through it and you can read all the rules and commandments and think, oh man, now I got to do all that. But that's only if it's all about you. If it's all about him, then you realize that he's already done all that for you. He's already fulfilled uh, all righteousness on your behalf. And any of the curses in the scripture or any of the punishments uh, for, for, not, for disobedience to God's word, He's already taken the punishment for you. It's not all about you. It's all about Him. And when you read the Bible and understand that it's not about you, it's about Him, um, it opens it up in a fresh way. And rather than being a burden, it lifts you. And it lifts your heart in, in gratitude and in worship. Don't you see? Uh, if it's all about you, you'll read the Bible and feel that it's a burden. But if you read it and see that it's all about Him, it will open your eyes to see how wide and far and deep his love is for you. Everything he's accomplished for you, and it will melt you. It'll melt your heart. So, in conclusion, um, do you feel like your life with Christ is dry uh, or, or, or dying? Do you feel like you've been suffocating spiritually? You're holding in your hands the very thing that can refresh and renew and restore your relationship with Christ. Now, here's the thing. Andy Harris never came down from Mount Everest. His body is still up there somewhere at 28,000 feet. He died literally holding the thing in his hands that could save his life. But because of the lack of that thing, he couldn't recognize it for what it is. Friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, you are holding in your hands the very thing that can bring life to your relationship with Christ. All you need to do is plug in, turn it on, and breathe. Who am I that the highest king would wear? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. 
who the sun sets free oh it's free indeed i'm a child of god yes i am free at last he has welcomed me his grace runs deep while i was a slave to sin jesus died Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for. I'm a child of God, yes I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. child of God. Yes, I am. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house is a place a child of God. Yes, I am. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Yes, I Thank you so much for joining us uh, for our online service from Lakeside Community Church in Sabinar, BC. And thanks to Westlife Church and Pastor Keith uh, for uh, sharing the message and the worship with us today. Um, if you are not part of a backyard gathering, I encourage you to get in touch with us as soon as you can, and we'll let you know what, uh, where those gatherings are in, the, in future weeks. And uh, if you have uh, a prayer request, or if you'd like to know how to partner with us uh, in giving, th that information will be on uh, the screen in just a moment. Thanks so much for joining us, and God bless you. Let me just uh, leave a blessing from God's word this morning from Romans chapter 15 and verse 13. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.